Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to talk about that. Uh, there's a very a general theme in, in number theory, which um, seeks to interpret uh, the values of, of zeta functions and L functions um, in terms of motives or cohomology and so forth. But the overarch overarching theme is to uh, interpret them as periods, period integrals on algebraic varieties. Um, so I'm going to be very specific in this talk and focus on the case of um, just an elliptic curve. So let's take an elliptic curve over Q for now. Um, associated to it is its L function, which is very famous. And we are interested in the values of this L function um, at integers n greater than or equal to two. Um, and I, specifically, I, I will focus on the case n equals two in, in just a moment. Um, so in this case, um, of course, there's this huge uh, web of, of uh, conjectures on, on special values of L functions. In this case, the relevant conjecture is Balinson's conjecture. And Balinson predicts that the value of the L function at two, for example, is a certain period of something of some extension constructed out of the cohomology of the elliptic curve. And I will explain very concretely what that means. Um, in this case, uh, the conjecture is, is a theorem. Um, it was proven in the case of modular curves, and in fact, for, for, for modular forms of, of all weights um, by Balinson and uh, later by, by Tony Scholl. Okay, so um, I'm going to begin with an extremely concrete example to illustrate the sorts of questions um, that one runs into. So this example is from a, um, a, a, a joint paper with a physicist, Claude Dewar. Um, the, it, it, the purpose of the paper was actually to uh, come up with a counterexample to a, a, a different conjecture. Um, um, and so this example is not perfectly adapted to this situation. I've kind of repurposed it, but I think it, it does the job. So um, here's the equation oops, of um, a plane elliptic curve, zy squared equals x cubed plus z cubed, very concrete. I'm going to set rho to be this particular cube root of unity. Um, and um, the first thing one realizes, though it's not completely essential for what I'm going to say, is that this elliptic curve has a modular parameterization. So that means if you remove a finite set of cusps C, um, which are given explicitly where, where the coordinate y takes these five values, um, then that open uh, locus is isomorphic to a um, particular quotient of the upper half plane H by this congruent subgroup gamma of six. Um, so this map phi is completely explicit. Um, and what you find is if you take um, a particular choice of holomorphic differential on this elliptic curve, dx over y, normalized suitably, then when you pull it back along this map, you get a cusp form, f of tor, of weight two for this uh, modular group. And this cusp form um, has a Fourier expansion, some a n q to the n, where q is uh, e to the two pi i tor divided by six in this case. And, and here's the beginning of the, the, the Fourier expansion, it's very concrete. And uh, the, the Fourier coefficients a n go into defining the L function. So, so here's the L function, um, L f of s, it's the sum, it's the Dirichlet series formed out of the coefficients of this modular form. Um, out of this L function, we form what's called the completed L function by multiplying by a, a suitable gamma factor, in this case, just a single uh, copy of the usual gamma function, some powers of pi, and the conductor to power s. And this function satisfies um, the functional equation uh, lambda f comma s equals lambda f of two minus s. Now the proof of this is very easy. You can just interpret this completed L function simply as a Mellin transform of this modular form. Um, it's basically an integral along the imaginary axis of the modular form times tau to the s minus one. And um, the, the, modular, the, the, the modularity of this function f, more precisely with respect to the inversion, 
tor goes to minus one over tor immediately gives the functional equation. So the question, um, or the homework question is, how can we interpret um, this, the value at two of lambda as a period? So of course, to consider the value of two of lambda of L is essentially, you know, it is, it is a trivial to, to get between the two. So how do you interpret lambda f comma two as a period? Well, you might think that this is, this is trivial because uh, it's already an integral. It's just an integral of, the modular, of this modular form along the imaginary axis. So it's a period integral, right? But that's completely false because uh, this integral does not admit an algebraic interpretation. In fact, when s is greater than or equal to one, uh, this integrand cannot be interpreted as a section of an algebraic vector bundle on the modular curve. So that is not correct. And the whole business is to interpret this uh, number uh, correctly. So to do this, we, I, I want to sort of start from first principles and, uh, and see how far we get without any, any sort of um, uh, magic ingredients. So here's a picture of the, um, uh, the, the affine elliptic curve in um, the affine space Z equals one. It looks like this and um, it naturally comes, so it's just Y squared equals X cubed plus one. And it naturally comes with two coordinates, X and Y. So more precisely, those coordinates are maps to affine lines. Uh, a projection onto the x-axis and a projection onto the y-axis. Now, as you can see from this picture, these projections are not etal um, where at, at certain points. So the projection onto the x-axis is not etal um, here at this point where the curve, the tangent becomes infinite, becomes vertical. And two other points we can't see, solutions to x cubed plus one equals zero. And similarly, the projection onto the y-axis horizontally fails to be a tile at plus one and minus one where the curve becomes horizontal again. Um, so those are bad loci and we shall remove them. Um, so I've, on this picture, I've removed all the fibers where the coordinate projections fail to be ital. So now we have um, an elliptic curve in, um, in, in projective two space, if you like, and we have a bunch of uh, lines which are marked in red. So actually we don't need all these lines. So I'm going to get rid of um, one of them and just retain uh, these two here, x equals rho and x equals rho bar. So now what we have, the geometry is follows. We have an elliptic curve in blue in, in P2 um, and we have four, uh, lines, four hyperplanes in red, and the red hyperplanes I'm going to call D, okay? So we have a configuration in P2. And the proposition is that the um, value at two of the completed L function times some explicit factor pi, four times pi times square root of three um, is given by a very explicit integral. Um, now, this integral is, is um, naturally associated to this geometry as follows. So th there's a chain of integration that I will come to in just a minute. And the differential form is, um, is something very natural. So we have omega of x defined down here, which is the unique um, logarithmic differential form, which has poles along these vertical red lines. And, and residue one at one of them and minus one at the other, I think. Similarly, um, the form omega y is the unique logarithmic one form with um, poles along the horizontal lines, y equals one and y equals minus one and residue plus one and minus one respectively. So these differential forms are simply, oops, sorry, I've gone the wrong way, um, are simply, um, differential forms that are pulled back from the coordinate, from the punctured coordinate axes onto the elliptic curve, okay? Or onto the ambient space. And um, these are one form. So if we take the wedge product, we get a two form and that two form can be integrated. And, and the proposition is that this um, very explicit algebraic um, logarithmic uh, two form 
integrates to give the value of the L function and therefore completes its interpretation as a period. Fine, so now I need to explain to you what this domain of integration is. And so what we need is a, um, a two-dimensional uh, chain of integration. Um, and it had better um, stay away from the poles of these differential forms um, for, for convergence, obviously, and for other reasons. So um, how do we do that? Ah, yes, there's, there's a, a slight technicality, which is that these, this uh, configuration is not normal crossing um, at the point at infinity. So um, a, a small technicality is that one should resolve the singularity at infinity by doing a, a blow up. Um, but you can just ignore this in, in the first instance. It, it's, it's important, but it's not very um, technically difficult and, it, and it's not crucial to this discussion. So um, that gives us a new space that I call P, but you can just pretend that it's P2 for simplicity in your mind if you prefer. So now we want to construct a, a, a two-dimensional chain of integration in P or P2, which avoids the red lines D, um, and with the property that its boundary is contained in the blue elliptic curve. So intuitively, we, we can think of this sort of green shaded region that I've drawn here. This is a, a region in, in the real points of projective two space. And indeed its boundary is contained as you can see in the blue elliptic curve. So um, what we want to do um, is uh, modify this because um, this chain of integration, as I've just naively defined it, um, clearly does not work because it meets the uh, red lines y equals one and y equals minus one, and which is where our differential forms have singularities. So that's too naive. And what we want to do is somehow deform this cycle in such a this chain in such a way that it avoids these um, red lines y equals one and y equals minus one. So when we deform it, it's not going to be in the in the real points anymore. It's going to be in the complex points of P2. But we can still um, say what it means for it to be real. Um, it's real, of course, if the homology class um, is equal to its complex conjugate as a homology class. Okay. Though the cycle itself will not be um, contained in the real points anymore. Okay, so how do we deform this chain? Um, well, we do it in two steps. So the first step is to view this elliptic curve as a Riemann surface. So it's the Riemann surface of the equation x equals the cube root of y squared minus one. Um, and therefore we can depict um, this elliptic curve as a triple sheeted cover of um, P1 with coordinate y. And um, it is ramified, well, here, here you see it's ramified at, at plus one and minus one um, on this, on this uh, affine chart. Um, so we have this, this triple cover um, of the punctured affine line and the projection I denoted pi y earlier is just the, the vertical projection in this picture. So what we can do then is, is um, consider the following green path on the affine line. So it's the path which goes from minus infinity, um, travels um, along or very close to the real axis in the y coordinate, then goes on a small loop to avoid the point minus one, keeps going, avoids the point plus one and goes on to infinity. Um, now, now that path is not invariant under complex conjugation. Um, so what one can do is take that green path I've drawn and add to it its complex conjugate. So the complex conjugate of this path is, is the same, except that as it travels along, it goes underneath minus one and plus one um, the opposite way. And the sum of those two paths is a homology class, which is complex conjugate invariant. And the way I like to think of this is simply a path that goes along the real axis and when it gets near to the point minus one, it bifurcates into two paths, which go both ways around minus one and rejoin afterwards. And similarly, when it gets close to one, it bifurcates into two paths, which join again. 
and that makes perfect sense as a homology class. So there we have a, a path of which I've only drawn, you know, half on this picture. And um, we can extend it. So think of it as the analog of the boundary along of this green cycle uh, in the elliptic curve. It's the deformed boundary. And we must show that it is indeed the boundary of a two chain. Um, so for that, you need a tiny bit of homological algebra. We consider the relative homology of um, the projective plane, the projective two space minus the divisor D relative to this elliptic curve. Um, that has a boundary map um, to a two chain associates a one chain, which is contained in the elliptic curve minus D. And we've just gone to the trouble of constructing a path in so one chain in um, the punctured elliptic curve. And using a little bit of Hodge theory, you can show that, that this uh, relative long exact homology sequence um, has the property that this term here, H1 P minus D actually vanishes. And that, that's for Hodge theoretic reasons. That, that group is zero, and that proves that there exists a two chain or a class in, in this relative two homology group, which whose boundary is P. And so that is the definition of our cycle sigma plus, which is depicted in cartoon form here. Though of course, in reality, it, it, wraps, it wraps around these red horizontal lines in some complicated way, which I could not possibly draw. So that's um, a real two chain on this relative homology group. And that's our chain of integration. And so the proposition I recall was that the integral of this very explicit differential form along this, um, this explicit two chain is the value of the L function at two. Does, Good. Does this, oh, sorry, does this uniquely pin down sigma? Like is, is that map delta? Well, no, and it's not, it's up to the, it's a homology cycle. But 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 the uh, oh I mean up to up to like as an element of homology does it uniquely pin it down or does the integral not matter which which preimage you not, um, not preimage you take um, you're asking me what's the kernel of this map to be honest yeah. I, I don't actually remember um, it's been a while since I've uh, been thinking about this to be honest um, but but integrating remember. integrating the kernel along this two form is is zero or something yes yes oh, okay. for, again for hard theoretic reasons because this this differential form sits in a particular. Um, because I think I think that's right. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. But I'm, I'm sorry. I can't remember whether this kernel is zero or not. That's all right. It, it may come back to me. Um, but I've computed it somewhere. Okay. So the 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 how how do you prove this um, proposition? Okay. So everything I'm going to say should should make actually no reference to modularity, but the the technique of proof uses modularity um, in, in a fundamental way. So, so what do we do? We, we, we start with the um, differential form on the right-hand side, and recall we had this modular parameterization of, of the punctured curve after you remove the cusps. And if you pull back omega x and omega y, you get, um, so they are logarithmic two forms with poles at the cusps by definition. And therefore they are um, modular forms which have poles at cusps. And you can check that they are precisely um, Eisenstein series of weight two, which I've called EX and EY tor, and you can work them out explicitly. So um, we can compute this integral on, on, the, on the upper half plane. Um, first step is to replace these differential forms with Eisenstein series. And the next observation is that you can actually take a primitive, you can actually integrate one of the Eisenstein series. Now you, you can't do that literally, um, but if you take its real part, you can show that it has a primitive. Uh, it is D of uh, an explicit function, which is a real analytic Eisenstein series. Um, and um, fine. So uh, if you plug that into the right hand side, you see that this, this uh, two dimensional integral um, after applying uh, Stokes formula reduces to a one-dimensional integral along some path in the upper half plane of an Eisenstein series times a real analytic Eisenstein series. Okay, so that's what happens if you transport this integral to the upper half plane. Now, now there's a bit of jiggery pokery that needs to be done here. So it's a little bit technical and I'm, I'm just gonna give the, the key um, heuristic idea. 
Um, and that's the once you've got an integral along a path in the upper half plane, along some geodesic, again, you can apply Stokes formula um, and essentially reduce this integral, or rather this integral times an integral of a cusp form. Um, and you can compute that by, um, by expressing that geodesic path as a component of the boundary of a fundamental domain. And the upshot is that you, you need to calculate a certain an integral of a two form over a fundamental domain here, h mod, oops, h mod gamma six. And the two form in question is uh, this thing. So the real analytic Eisenstein series times a holomorphic Eisenstein series times the complex conjugate of a cusp form um, of the same cusp form as before. Um, so you have there's a couple of steps to do this, you have, believe me. Um, now this thing uh, is, is something very classical. It, it's essentially a Peterson in a product um, and the rankin selberg or unfolding technique uh, computes this for you and tells you that it is a product of two values of the L function of this cusp form. Um, and when you put everything together, that shows that, the, uh, that this integral you started out with is indeed um, one of these um, uh, 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 L values of, of the cusp form in question. Um, so this, um, I don't think this has been worked out, these steps have been worked out explicitly in the literature, um, but I have done it in, um, in the case of level one, in full generality and in, all, um, uh, in all weights, um, very explicitly. Um, so in principle, this, this, this should extend easily um, to, to the high level case um, along precisely these lines. But anyway, the, the important thing to remember is, um, it is, is the interpretation of this integral i as um, a, an integral along a line, along a, a path, so it's a path integral of an Eisenstein series times a real analytic Eisenstein series. And you can reinterpret that as saying um, that it's just the real part of what's called an iterated integral of two Eisenstein series. So um, the only thing I want to sort of retain from this, this, this technique from com for computing the integral um, is, is this slogan that the L function of, um, so the L value at the point two of this elliptic curve is nothing other than um, the iterated integral of two Eisenstein series, more precisely its real part. And, and I think that's a very interesting interpretation of this, um, L value, and it's kind of implicit in, in Balenson's uh, original work on this topic, that it's, it's in a very different language. Good, um, so, um, so we've understood why the L value is, a, is a, a period integral of some kind. Now we need to explain the extension underlying it to talk about Balenson's conjecture. So we've kind of already seen this uh, geometry um, before when we were trying to construct this relative integration cycle. And so the obvious thing to do is to look at the relative cohomology of uh, projective plane minus the bad red divisors where we have poles relative to the elliptic curve. So this is just, sorry, the, the cohomology of, of, of this picture, you know, you delete the red lines and take relative to the blue stuff. It's a very natural thing to do. Um, so that gives us a, a cohomology group H2 in your favorite cohomology theory. And I'm going to focus on, on Durham cohomology and, and Betty um, homology. So this, this uh, um, cohomology group or motive, if you like, is, is kind of complicated, um, but sitting inside it is a subquotient um, uh, N, sorry, uh, I can't seem to highlight this, um, which has rank three. And it is um, a, an extension of this thing here, Q, chi minus two, it's, it's essentially um, just, um, uh, just a Tate motive. Um, th this chi is, is some twisting of some character related to this root of unity. It's a small detail that's, that's not really essential. Um, so it's an extension of something, um, a, a one dimensional object that's very explicit by the cohomology of the elliptic curve, which is of course a rank two um, object. Um, as I said before, at the very beginning, this example is not brilliantly adapted to this problem. If one was a bit more careful, I'm sure you could just have a, a, 
you know, Q, Q of minus two here on the right if, if one wanted, but it, this is the way it came out. Okay, so this um, three-dimensional um, subquotient is um, in each realization is just a three-dimensional vector space. So in Durham cohomology, it has um, two, uh, so we're talking about differential forms. It has two generators coming from the H1 of the elliptic curve. So these are one forms an elliptic curve. So we of course have the um, holomorphic differential x dx over y, and we have the differential dx over y of the second kind. And this the the this this quotient here q uh, of rank one is spanned by this logarithmic two form we constructed omega x wedge omega y. So we know all the differential forms very explicitly. They're completely concrete. The Betty um, cohomology, or rather it's dual, the Betty homology is also of rank three and it's spanned by three chains of integration, if you like. There's the sigma plus that I explained how to construct, um, which is real. There's one that is um, uh, not real. So it's, it's anti-invariant under complex conjugation called sigma minus which I haven't explained explicitly. And there's another um, sigma zero plus, which is some kind of tubular, it, it looks like some tubular, tubular neighborhood sitting around a point of intersection. Uh, it's one of the corners of this divisor D. So it's like a product of circles. Um, so you have these quite explicit homology cycles. And to compute this, you have to use, uh, you have to use a Manandrinfeld theorem and, and some technicalities, but, um, that's the fundamental reason why you get a, a, an extension in, in, in this particular situation. Okay, fine. So we've got the Durham cohomology, we've got the Betty homology, and the thing to do in this context is to uh, pair them together and form the period matrix, which is the matrix of entries you get by integrating every differential form against every chain of integration. Um, now in the top left-hand corner, we have a two by two uh, matrix, which is simply the period matrix associated to the elliptic curve. Here, this, this group H1 of E on the left here. Um, so uh, as is extremely classical, uh, an elliptic curve has, has two um, periods uh, denoted omega plus and omega minus, and two quasi periods, eta plus and eta minus. And omega plus and omega minus are the periods with respect to the holomorphic differential, dx over y, and eta plus and eta minus are the periods um, with respect to the difference of the second kind, x to x over y. Um, then we have some zeros down here for, for, for Hodge theoretic reasons. Um, the period of this um, quotient here, q, um, is just essentially a, a, um, a multiple of, of two pi i squared. So in fact, it's i pi squared over square root of three. So this, this character, this Dirichlet character, quadratic character chi I didn't mention, that just gives rise to the square root of three here. And the period we're interested in, which was the integral of omega x wedge omega y, this two form, um, over this two chain sigma plus gives by the previous proposition precisely the value of the L function of the elliptic curve times some proof factor. And so that basically, um, that's basically it for Bailenson's conjecture. We've um, shown how the L function of the elliptic curve at the point two is a period integral, which can be interpreted as a period of this very explicit extension of um, uh, uh, a trivial object, a Tate motive, if you like, Tate cohomology group, but by the um, cohomology H1 of, of E, this extension here. And that's what Bailenson's conjecture predicts. Now, the way I've, um, I've written this, you can, you can immediately see the elephant in the room, which is that this period matrix is missing an entry, right? All the entries are either zero or very classical or well-known numbers, but there's one that's missing. And um, so let's give it a name. Let's call it CF2 because it doesn't have a name. And there is no known conjecture um, which explains what it is. And so we're led to an obvious question, which is um, at the bottom of the page here, which is um, how do we think about 
this missing period, C f comma two. And the first remark um, to make is that the question doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense because um, this period matrix is not well defined. It depends on a choice of basis of, uh, well, this choice of basis that I've written here of the Durham cohomology and the Betty homology. However, um, however, the same uh, criticism applies to Bailinson's conjecture. But in fact, you can see that this matrix isn't completely, this basis isn't completely arbitrary because there's a lot of structure that it needs to respect. Um, the um, Durham cohomology has a Hodge and a weight filtration, which is this upper triangular structure. So the basis has to respect that. Um, so in fact, this omega x wedge omega y isn't just a random choice of differential form, it's completely canonical. It's cut out by the Hodge and weight filtrations. So this entire column of the period matrix is completely well-defined. And if we look on, on the rows, the homology, in fact, the first row and the last row, sorry, the, the first row is, is completely well-defined because it's the part of the homology that's invariant under complex conjugation. So this entry, at least up to a rational multiple, makes perfect sense. And that's why Bainison's conjecture makes sense. But this entry here in the missing slot does not make sense because what you can do to this matrix is you can always legitimately add a multiple of the third row to the second row. In other words, you can change, this goes back to the earlier question, I suppose, the, 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 the cycle sigma minus is not well-defined and you can add to it a rational multiple of sigma minus zero. So the question doesn't make sense to ask what's the entry here. It depends on your choice of basis. However, um, you can say, well, let's look at the vector space generated by um, the two numbers, CF2Q and I pi squared over square root of three. So that's a two dimensional vector space. And that is completely well defined. So the better question is to say, can we um, formulate a conjecture that predicts, um, that, that generates this vector space? And, and the answer is no, of course, in the literature, there is no such conjecture. I don't think anyone's asked this question before. Um, and clearly this is a very sort of basic invariant of an elliptic curve um, because um, something I forgot to tell you, which is also part of the Benison conjectures, which states that this extension is um, conjecturally unique. It's, it's supposedly the unique such um, extension of this kind. And therefore the entries of this period matrix or rather the invariants of this matrix are invariants of the elliptic curve. And so this question by rights makes sense and it should have some intrinsic answer, um, well, intrinsic to the elliptic curve itself. So there should be some conjecture that, or there should be a whole panoply of conjectures that describes these kinds of numbers. So the, the tentative answer, uh, well, in, in this case, the answer is yes, we can interpret this space using something called mixed L functions. So that introduces the second half of my talk, which will be about these mixed L functions. Hello? Sorry for in, uh, to interrupt you. Before yeah. we go on, I have a, a basic question about this N. Uh, do we know that it's uh, genuinely a submotive or is it just a sub-object uh, if you consider the two uh, realizations, Betty and Dera? Um, So, um, again, I, I'm a bit rusty on this. I think it's defined only using um, the weight filtration, if I recall correctly, um, and um, some very simple geometry of the elliptic curve, maybe some involution or something. I, okay, I, so it's generally actually a sub question in the category of more. Of course. So in, in this case, I mean, we only care about the category of mixed hot structures, but I think it's actually, I mean, any category. I um, but I'm not 100% sure that I didn't use um, the Hodge filtration or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think I did. Um, but I, I'm, I'm fairly sure that it, it's, it's true in, in any, in, in your favorite category. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but, I, but I'm not completely sure about that. I also, um, so I was wondering in your example, your elliptic curve is CM, I think. So, yes, so I was wondering if the period conjecture suggests that there should be some relationship between the three numbers you're studying. With Absolutely. So, so that's a total accident, by the way, it's just because, um, for this physics, Problem, we came up with the simplest possible elliptic curve that was a counter example. It doesn't need to be CM for this talk at all. Um, yeah, what it does is um, the, the rank, sort of the, the 
if you like, the, 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 um, the dimension, the transcendence degree of the space spanned by this, um, the periods of the elliptic curve drops. So there's an extra relation. Um, this the, like the, the permanent of this period matrix is, is algebraic or something like that. But it doesn't affect these two guys on the right here. Yeah. It doesn't tell you anything about the last column. Cool. No, it doesn't. Um, yeah, thanks for pointing that. I'd, I'd forgotten that. It, it's absolutely correct. Yeah, the, but the CM's a complete red herring here. It doesn't. Um, um, it, it's irrelevant for the for this, for this the discussion about these particular periods. Okay, so are there any more questions about um, that part? No. Nope. Okay. Um, so the second part of the talk is um, to try to um, enlarge the, the the class of available numbers. Again, they should be defined intrinsically out of algebraic varieties, um, which could provide the, the missing the interpretation for missing periods. So sort of the theme in, in, in the subject is you, you, you're given these L functions that have been around for centuries, um, and, and you try to interpret their values as periods of algebraic varieties. But I want to do the opposite. I want to take certain periods of algebraic varieties, such as the one we saw, um, this number C, which is a very explicit integral over an explicit cycle. And we want to interpret it with some new kind of L function. So how are we going to cook up a new kind of L function? There are various definitions of mixed L functions in the literature, but I do not believe that they are the correct thing um, in this case. I mean, so they, they, there are degenerate cases where they happen to, the definitions happen to agree, but in general, um, I don't think that they are the right answer. So my definition here is a bit roundabout, um, but it is quite natural if you bear with me. So we start off, the input data is a bunch of functions, theta one up to theta r, which should be thought of as theta functions. And they are for now any functions on the positive reals to complex numbers, which are just continuous. We assume two properties. One, that they satisfy a functional equation with respect to inversion. So theta i one over t is t to the w i, where w i is some integer, which we think of as a weight, um, times the function. Um, so it's a bit like a modular form, I suppose, or, or it's restriction to the um, imaginary axis. And then we have some asymptotic condition. We demand that the, the theta function essentially um, uh, tends to zero, or what has a piece which tends to zero exponentially fast as t goes to infinity, and a sort of divergent part that grows at most polynomially um, as t goes to infinity. So it's a polynomial plus something that's converging to infinity, very, going to zero very fast to infinity. And from that, we can define uh, the mixed L function, which is a function of R complex variables, simply to be an iterated integral of um, Mellin transforms of these theta functions. So you take theta one, t one, t one to the s one minus one dt one, you integrate that, you multiply by the next theta function, et cetera, and you keep integrating. So that's just an iterated integral from zero to infinity. And it's completely explicit. Now, in general, that doesn't converge. When you have these theta, the, there's this non-exponentially non suppressed growth at infinity, this diverges. But there's a canonical way to regularize that using tangential base points. Um, it's extremely explicit. I've written it explicitly somewhere. And it, it's 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 easy to 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 write closed formulae for for this. Um, but you can just ignore the regularization in the first instance. Um, so a, a version of these functions was considered by Manning a while ago, where the thetas were um, were cusp forms specifically. Um, so the first example are um, modular forms. So a bit more general than Manning, because I'm going to allow um, a non-cusp form, the Eisenstein series. So the first example is if you take any modular form um, of weight W, an eigenfunction for the Fricker involution on this congruent subgroup, then if you simply restrict the um, cusp form to the vertical um, imaginary axis, suitably normalized, you get a theta function. So modular forms give. Uh, a whole panoply of examples. But much more generally, in fact, if you take any motivic L function, so the L function of any motive, so the motive needs to be self-dual, um, that's a technicality that we don't, just a simplification for the purposes of this talk. But conjecturally, every uh, motivic L function 
is um, a Dirichlet series, and it's supposed to satisfy a functional equation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you make those assumptions, um, then it was explained by, by Zaghi and Dochester how you can associate to such an L function a, a very general theta function. And the theta function is something very explicit. It's just this, um, it's an expansion um, using the same Dirichlet, uh, the, series, the same coefficients in the Dirichlet series definition of L and, and some very explicit um, function, which, is, which you just compute once and for all. And it only depends on the gamma factors of the L function. Um, so for modular form, it's some exponential, but in general, it's some hypergeometric function. Um, and, and then the, the, the Mativic L function, the completed Mativic L function is just the L function of the associated theta function. So the, the simplest possible example is where you take uh, the trivial motive, cohomology H0 of a point. In this case, the L function is the Riemann zeta function. Its completion is the Riemann psi function. And that is just the Mellin transform of the Jacobi theta function here. So um, it's interesting that already for the completely trivial motive, you get quite an interesting theta function coming out. Fine, so theta functions, there's no shortage of supply of interesting theta functions um, meeting the requirements of the definition. So then if we take this mixed L function, we find that it always defines a meromorphic function on uh, in our complex variables, which has at most simple poles along very specific hyperplanes. It always satisfies a functional equation um, where you um, each, S, each um, complex parameter SI gets reflected, WR, WI minus SI, and interestingly that the orders of, of, of the theta functions gets reversed. Um, and also a, a general property of iterated integrals immediately implies that these L functions form an algebra. If you multiply two such L functions, it is a linear combination of other such L functions. So th this, this property, these properties are trivial. They follow immediately from the definition once you've uh, set up the regularization correctly. And I want to focus on what I call totally critical values. So, so for classical L function, you have a notion of, of a critical value it's where the, the, um, the gamma factors um, in the functional equation have no poles. And so by extension, we can define a totally critical value, which are the integer values of this mixed L function, where each integer is critical for each corresponding um, theta function. So we have defined a vast array of numbers that come just out of motive. You give me any bunch of motives, this produces a huge array of numbers. And the question is, of course, are these um, interesting and are they relevant to the question that I pose at the beginning? So to, um, to try to answer that question, I'm now just going to give you lots of examples of totally critical values of mixed L functions and try to convince you that these are extremely interesting and that they answer the question I started with. So the simplest thing you can start off with um, is to look at um, cusp forms, sorry, and sorry, not cusp forms, in fact, any modular forms of weight two on a uh, modular curve. So you pick a, a, a congruent subgroup gamma zero of n of SL2z, take any um, R um, modular forms, F1 up to FR, including Eisenstein series, and that the functional equation of, the, of their corresponding L functions is S goes to two minus S, so there's only one critical value in this case, and that's the point S equals one. And so when you construct the, the, the mixed L function, there's only one interesting, totally critical uh, point to look at, which is the point one comma one, 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 one. Um, and indeed you can show in that case that these numbers are always periods. They are periods of something called the unipotent fundamental group of the corresponding modular curve. So there are periods of very interesting um, iterated extensions of um, motives or cohomology of the modular curve. And you, you might think this is a bit um, limiting because the, um, you've only got this one point where you can, you can take these L values, but don't forget that you can, uh, the F1 up to FR could be chosen arbitrarily in, in, in any order. So in fact, there's a, there's a huge array of such numbers. More generally, you can take these modular forms to have arbitrary, rate, arbitrary weights. 
in which case you can now take the arguments to be any integer included between one and the weight minus one. So now you have a, a huge amount of, of numbers and you can prove that these are all periods of what's called the relative completion of the modular curve, um, which is also something that is, um, can be built out of the cohomology of the modular curve as some kind of iterated extension. Um, good, so these are all periods. Um, so from now on, um, to make things a bit more precise, I'm just going to focus on the case of uh, level one, which is the case I've studied in some detail. Um, so now we're going to focus on SL2Z. And um, so the, the underlying, these are periods of some object, um, which is what's called the relative completion of the fundamental group of M11, uh, the moduli stack of elliptic curves. So this is a very, very interesting um, central object. Um, and these, uh, in this case, these, these mixed L values are, are, are computing um, some of its periods. So in level one, we have um, uh, the following modular forms. We have Eisenstein series, um, starting from weight four in all even weights, um, which are normalized um, in the following way. They're normalized to have rational Fourier coefficients. So the Fourier expansion here involves the divisor function, sigma 2k minus one. And the first Fourier coefficient is, sorry, the zeroth Fourier coefficient is a Bernoulli number, which is rational. Um, so that's the rational, the correct sort of normalization for the Eisenstein series that we want to take. Um, already the L function associated to this Eisenstein series, or rather the corresponding theta function when you restrict it to the vertical imaginary axis, is already quite interesting. It's a product of um, completed Riemann zeta functions. Um, but interestingly, it has this, uh, this pre-factor, which is a polynomial in S. And this polynomial in S looks uh, completely innocuous, but it does something very interesting indeed. And what it does is it, it punches out um, certain poles in the gamma factors, and essentially uh, it, it sort of changes the definition of what, what it means to be a critical value. It enables you to access more critical values in, in, these, um, in these Riemann psi functions. So this is quite a subtle operation actually, even though it looks completely trivial. Um, and, and so secret, if you know about motives, these Riemann psi functions are, are somehow associated to a direct sum of tape motives secretly. Um, the first cusp form in level one is the Ramanujan cusp form of weight 12, as is very well known. And it has this very explicit for expansion I've written here. Okay, so, so we have some um, very explicit modular forms on SL2Z. We restrict them to the um, imaginary axis. We get some theta functions and we can build some multiple L functions out of them. Um, and the question is, what, what numbers do we get? So here are some examples. Well, the very first example is just the L function of an Eisenstein series. And let's just take its value at one. And then you can show that you always get the odd values of the Riemann zeta function with some explicit rational prefactor. Maybe it's rational with some, some power of pi perhaps, but it's some explicit prefactor times an odd zeta value. And if you work out what this means um, in the case k equals one, then this gives you, uh, the left-hand side gives you a formula for zeta of three. And in fact, if you're careful about it, you retrieve uh, a famous formula due to Ramanujan um, from about a hundred years ago, which expresses the Riemann zeta uh, three as what's called a Lambert series, which is an extremely fast converging series. Um, and, and so already you get, you get something interesting already in this extremely um, basic example. Um, here's another example. So if we look at um, the, um, this particular linear combination of double L values of Eisenstein series G4, G10. Um, so this particular linear combination gives you uh, the L value of the Ramanujan cusp form. Uh, so a non-critical value. Um, so this is very interesting because it means that some, um, some non-critical single L value is in fact a totally critical double L value. And so these uh, different L values are somehow talking to each other in some very interesting way. Um, and this incidentally, this is a generalization 
of the key identity we had in the first part of the talk, where the L value of the elliptic curve at two was a double Eisenstein integral. And this is the generalization of that. We have the analog of the L value of the elliptic curve at two is now the L value of this Ramanujan cusp form at 12. And again, it's expressible in terms of double Eisenstein integrals. Okay, so this is exactly the same phenomenon we had in the first part of the talk. Then the, the, the corresponding companion period. So, so again, this, um, this uh, L value of a cusp form sits in some um, extension, some rank three object, which is a simple extension of, uh, of, of motives. Um, um, the, the same as, as, in, as in the first part, you have some unknown um, companion period, which has no interpretation, but we can interpret it indeed as a double, um, as a, a mixed L value associated to two Eisenstein series. So again, this answers um, a generalization of the question asked in the first part of the talk. What else do we get? So we actually, we also get multiple zeta values. So here's another example. If I take um, a, a double L value, a different one this time at the point one comma one, I get a non-trivial multiple zeta value, zeta three comma five. And in, in fact, um, this gives you a Lambert series expression for multiple zeta value, which is also um, something which is new and uh, was worked out by my PhD student, Alex Saad. So here's his, his theorem and his PhD thesis a few years ago. Um, very sadly, uh, he's chosen to leave mathematics. Um, his thesis was magnificent. Um, it's on the archive. And in his thesis, he showed um, the theorem that, that all mixed tape motives of the integers are modular of level one. Um, so so I, I won't explain in detail what that slogan means, um, but it has the following very beautiful corollary, which is that every multiple zeta value can be uh, expressed as a linear combination of these uh, multiple uh, mixed L values associated to Eisenstein series. So uh, the upshot is um, these multiple L functions at least give all multiple zeta values. In fact, his term is much more precise than, than, than this corollary states. Um, he, he gives very precise um, information about what the weights are and what the values are. Good. Okay, so all of these examples are, um, are where, um, um, where, where the totally critical values are sort of inside, inside this, the, this, the critical strip, inside of the, the, um, the, the region um, bounded by the functional equation. So uh, to test whether these multiple L values are interesting, um, it's good to go back to the most basic example possible the Riemann psi function, um, where the functional, the, the, the critical strip is um, um, between real part of S between zero and one, and there are no integer points um, sitting inside it. Um, so, so let's consider a psi of s, which is, as I said, the, the L function associated to the Jacobi theta function. And we can construct the double version by looking at two Jacobi theta functions. And these functions satisfy these two functional equations. Um, the first is, is, is the, the, the general functional equation. The second is, is this algebra, this multiplicative structure I mentioned um, earlier, which is a, a general property of these. Uh, multiple L functions. So for the Riemann zeta function, there, as I said, there, there are no interesting points inside the critical strip, which are integer, integer points, but the critical value, the interesting critical values are the even values, where the even, um, whereas we know that the, the values of the Riemann zeta function are proportional to powers of pi. So the natural thing to look at for this double Riemann psi function are um, doubly even values. And I was very curious to see what they give. So the bit of computation, so let me state here the, the answer. You can show that they have a very explicit expression as these certain uh, nested sums, which look a bit like multiple zeta values, except they have these sort of quadratic, um, these quadratic um, expressions in the denominators. Um, in fact, there's a whole literature on these single sums, um, but these, these double sums seem to me to be new possibly. Um, and you can prove with a bit of work that these uh, numbers are indeed periods, and they're periods of simple extensions of symmetric powers of the H1 of a very special, special elliptic curve. It's the CM elliptic curve associated to the Gaussian integers. 
And then again, by, um, by Bailinson's conjecture, half of these numbers are L values of the hecker croson character associated to the CM elliptic curve. And the other half of these numbers are the companion for the new periods um, associated that sit in the period matrix of the corresponding simple extensions. Um, so all these examples show um, that there's a, that these mixed L functions, um, uh, at least in, 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 the, um, in, in these situations, answer the question uh, I initially posed and give lots of other very interesting numbers. Um, so I have a whole load of slides, which I, I don't have time to cover in the last three minutes. Perhaps I'll just quickly um, uh, show you something else for fun. Um, if, um, if you'll just bear with me just for a couple of minutes. So here's a, a, another example of a problem which these functions, these objects solve. And the problem is construct the periods of cohomology groups or, or motives, which are um, of a certain type, um, which are a rank three again, but now not a simple extension, but a double extension. Um, and um, so, so the, the simple extensions, it's, it's known how to do that. You, you just use a, a Riemann zeta function. So the top left-hand block of this matrix is, is just uh, the, the period matrix for zeta three. The bottom right-hand block is, is essentially period matrix for zeta of nine times some power of two pi i. And there's some number in the top right-hand corner. And the question is, how do you, how do you find that number? Um, it, it's essentially unique. Um, and, and so, of course, there's this, there's Deline's um, huge program. Um, he, he made this conjecture that all mixed tape motives are generated by iterated integrals on P1 minus three points, which I, I proved uh, about a decade ago. And this is the answer that it gives. Um, the missing period entry in this period matrix is this unbelievably complicated um, combination of multiple zeta values. And the ones I've highlighted in blue are double zeta values. Um, which are on their own insufficient, you have to have a, a, a multiple zeta value in yellow here of depth four in order to, to, to find this period. There's simply no other way to do it. So it's unbelievably complicated. It's very, very difficult. Use a lot of machinery to come up with this answer. But using this mixed L function, um, there's a sort of pure thought way um, to generate a double L function. And um, the answer just pops out as this incredibly simple expression is two, uh, a double L function associated to two Eisenstein series, G4, G10. And there's four and 10 and no accidents. It's because we, we started off with uh, a three, uh, essentially a three and a nine. Uh, and that gives you four and 10 if you add one. Um, so that's another example of, of, a, of a problem that, that, is, that is made um, very much simpler using this new machining. Fine, so I'm really at the end of time. There's a whole other section I'll skip. Um, the conclusion is um, that there should be um, a very general conjecture which goes beyond the, the um, Balinson and Deligne and Bloch-Cato and um, Hamagawa number conjectures on special values of L functions, um, which captures um, a much more general class of periods. Um, so I, I believe that such a, a conjecture makes sense and should exist. Um, the next um, part of my talk was to propose um, a, a possible definition of multiple L functions, which had some good analytic properties, um, which should answer the first question. And um, these, I, what I didn't mention is that these multiple L functions actually arise in, in other contexts. They arise in, in the context of real analytic modular forms. They arise um, as Mellin transforms of something which is very well studied in high energy physics. Um, some, some objects called modular graph functions which arrive in string theory and which are extremely popular in string theory. So, so there's another way to arrive at the same, uh, at a similar definition. Um, so it looks like at least in the, in the modular forms case, it's the right definition. And I tried to convince you by um, giving infinitely many families of cases where their totally critical values are indeed periods of very interesting motives. So, so the next step in this, um, uh, in this program, which, which uh, I feel a bit um, bad because I gave this talk, I gave talks like this um, 
ages ago, and I, and I just simply haven't had any time, unfortunately, to make um, to, to, to look at this. But um, what would be great is to, as a next step, would be to formulate a very precise conjecture in, in some simple cases. So go back to the example in my first part of my talk, take a general elliptic curve of a Q and express um, this, this unknown period, or rather the vector space it generates, using some multiple L function of the, uh, the, the, um, the um, inverse Mellon transform of the L function elliptic curve and some Eisenstein series. So I, I hope that there should be some very concrete and explicit conjecture that relates to these numbers in the same spirit as the um, uh, classical conjectures on L values. So I'm sorry, a minute over, over time and I'll, I'll stop there if there are any questions. <laughs>